Okay, so I would also like to thank the organizers for putting together this very stimulating event and for inviting me to participate. Um, so, and I'd like to thank Ricardo for a very interesting paper. Um, he covers a wide uh, array of topics in that paper, so I'm just going to pick up on a couple of the principles that he articulates. Um, and those are going to have to do with the Fed's goals and transparency in its decision processes. And I guess my remarks are also going to pick up, you know, and I will say even I cribbed from some of the, the papers earlier in the day in thinking about how these goals have evolved over time. So in particular, I want to ask whether it's in the Fed's power even to achieve all of its goals um, and whether, or whether some of those goals conflict with each other and then ask about you know, what we could mean by transparency in, in cases where uh, some goals are either unattainable or, or conflict with other goals. All right, so here, here's where I've cribbed from uh, earlier papers, so it's, it's useful to come late in the day. So the, the, it was very interesting for me to see how the Fed's goals have evolved over time. So when the Fed was first established, uh, as a number of uh, earlier speakers have noted, um, elastic credit was mentioned as uh, one of its goals. And part of this was just you know, to take the seasonal out of interest rates, which uh, back at that time were a big deal, and, and also to act as a lender of last resort. Then after World War I, and then even more during and after World War II, the Fed was under a lot of pressure from the Treasury to accommodate you know, wartime financing, so another, another pressure. Um, during the 1930s, the bank runs added uh, you know, another, another goal for the Fed, which would be to, to prevent uh, runs on commercial banks. Um, <clears throat> Then explicitly, the, in 1951, the, the Treasury Fred Accord made price stability another goal. And uh, in 1978, Humphrey Hawkins added full employment. And then, like, there's more stuff, too. You could add, you know, you know growth and balance and a lot of other things are mentioned. But uh, this, is a, this is a long enough list. So I think the Fed has suffered from mission creep. So... You know, it's, you can ask, you know, as, as, a, as an economist, you know, I still count equations and unknowns, and, and here I'm going to count, you know, targets and instruments. So let's see, you know, how many targets and how many instruments we've got. So, you know, the, the, uh, the seasonals, they seem to be completely taken care of. I don't know how they do it, but, you know, in my entire life as an economist, I've never, there's been plenty of discussion about interest rate. Seasonals, you know, never were, uh, you know, the Fed has done well with that. Um, Preventing runs on commercial banks, so that was an issue, and we just invented the, F, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company to take, uh, to take care of that, so that in the latest crisis, runs on commercial banks were not an issue. Um, then there's to prevent or ameliorate financial crises more broadly, um, and we've heard a lot of talk about that. So, um, and I would like to endorse you know, Doug Diamond's comment about how, what the, the Fed's you know, outstanding response uh, during the recent crisis in, in being innovative about uh, how, to, how to fulfill its lender of last resort uh, function. Um, and, and then more recently, adding stress tests, hopefully to prevent future crises. All right, so far so good. And now we've got price stability. Well, we could use interest rates to try and target inflation. And then we have full employment, and we have accommodating the Treasury. So now I'm going I'm to maybe depart a little bit from um, my, the earlier speakers and pick up on the last part of the subtitle for this conference and, and start uh, looking at the challenges ahead. So... Uh, Two important challenges, I think, are going to be to deal with the sluggish recovery and, and then to deal with the large, you know, outstanding debt and, and ongoing deficits. So I think, you know, pressure from the Treasury is likely to come back. Now, you can say that the latter is a, 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 you know, it's a fiscal problem, but um, I think if we look at the EU area, we'll see the, you know, the central bank's not going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be drawn in. So how, how are these uh, challenges going to be reconciled with price stability, and how much can the Fed really do about full employment? So I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to put out what I think is one scenario for why we have a sluggish recovery 
and and why I think you know maybe the Fed's powers to you know uh, increase the speed of the recovery are, are actually pretty limited. So uh, as in any recession, investment in the last recession uh, fell dramatically. Investment is always the most volatile component of uh, of spending. Um, and it's it's re- it's remained you know remarkably low. So that's been where some of the, the the if you ask about the slow recovery, much of it has been there. Now at the same time, a lot of big firms are holding excess cash reserves, so it doesn't seem to be an inability to borrow. So here I've put a, a figure. This is from uh, uh, um, Tom Cooley and Peter Rupert um, have put together a, a, a whole set of figures comparing the current you know, downturn with earlier recessions. So what they do is for each recession uh, measure from the previous peak just the percentage gain in, you know, they have GDP, they have various measures. So here I've put uh, uh, private domestic investment. So the, the blue line is the current episode and the other lines are earlier recessions, so we have 1973, 83, 90, and 2001. So you see, compared with the previous peak, the, the fall was much steeper, and, and the recovery has, has been much slower. So this is just on the, on the x-axis is uh, quarters since the, 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 the peak. All right, so that's one fact. Um, another fact is, as you all know, the U.S. has been running large deficits, and the debt-to-GDP ratio has been you know, growing by leaps and bounds in the last few years. And on top of that, Social Security and Medicare are going to rise as the baby boomers retire. Uh, recent health care reforms may add to the bill as well. And so, you know, if you read the newspapers, you'll know that you know, every, the U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal course, and, and some kind of major reforms are going to be needed in the not-too-distant future. Okay, so here I have another uh, graph. So this is the debt-to-GDP ratio. Uh, so this goes from uh, the line starts in 1939 and comes up to the present, and with a peak, you know, right after World War II, you see a, a rapid, you see a decline, uh, the, the, uh, and it re- got down as low as uh, about 30% in 1980, and then it's fluctuated a bit and climbed pretty dramatically in recent years. And, you know, we're not quite back at the post-World War II peak, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, and there's also, the, there's no consensus on what fiscal reforms uh, should look like. Oops. So how much should come from taxes and how much uh, should come from changes in spending? Um, and if we do it from taxes, which one? So there's a lot of uncertainty about what that fiscal f- reform is going to look like when it comes. And Baker, Bloom, and Davis have constructed an uncertainty index. Um, there it is. And you can see this index, you know, is kind of uh, pretty low in the 90s and aughts, and then uh, uh, jumped way up during the crisis and has remained pretty high since then. It's coming down a bit uh, in the last year. So uh, I want to. So, so another hypothesis, and I've, again, you can read about this in the newspaper, is that, that fiscal uncertainty is contributing to depressed investment. There's a lot of investors have a lot of discretion about the timing of investment spending, um, and uncertainty, you know, sort of large-scale uncertainty about fiscal policy increases the option value of waiting, and so part of the decline in investment perhaps is just firms have a lot of projects on the shelf that they don't want to uh, make decisions about until they see the res- resolution of the fiscal uncertainty. And this goes back to uh, an early paper of uh, Governor Bernanke's. And, you know, my only, uh, I'm just going to say fiscal policy here is the source of the uncertainty. All right, so what does this have to do with the Fed? Um, much of the public, including Congress, seems to think that the Fed can by itself steer the economy to full employment. In Humphrey Hawkins, this idea was uh, kind of written into, you know, uh, the law of the land. So what's the, what's the evidence on this point? Can the Fed really affect employment? Um, so uh, to my mind, there's, it's, it's, it's kind of an asymmetric thing. So I'll go quickly over, over this. So the, there's, there's certainly evidence that in... Uh, when central banks tighten rather sharply, they can cause recessions. 
So when have they done this? It's, it's in, in periods of high inflation, the tightening is to bring down the rate of inflation, and often, if not always, you, you, you get a recession. Often a short one, but um, that there it is. So uh, there's evidence from Sargent. There's uh, the, the Volcker recession. And it's hard to think of examples on the other side where a central bank has lifted an economy out of recession during the 70s. Uh, I guess we tried it, and it didn't work very well. So can the Fed do the job all by itself? I, you know, central bankers are fond of analogies, so I'll say, you know, a, a, being from the Midwest, a good corn crop requires lots of inputs, sunshine and fertilizer, as well as rain. And if you don't have the sun and you don't have the nitrogen, you know, more rain doesn't, doesn't compensate. So, you know, the, the, the Fed can do its part, but it, it can't do everything. Um, so the Fed can't do much to compensate for fiscal mismanagement. And I would say that the, uh, the economics profession, our contribution could be to you know, try and at least inform the public and Congress about the fact that the Fed has limited uh, powers. Thank you.